Russian President Vladimir Putin's latest warning of, quote, lightning fast retaliation should the West interfere in Ukraine. And with Putin repeatedly threatening to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war, historians and military analysts see similarities to the Cuban Missile Crisis. In fact, uh, we had David Ignatius actually saying, uh, I think last week, that, that actually what we're going through now may be more dangerous than what we went through in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let's bring in right now the CEO of the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation, historian Mark Updegrove. He is the author of the new book, uh, in incomparable grace, JFK in the presidency. Mark, thank you so much for being with us. You know, I, I, we always we always want to look at leaders who um, who have failed, uh, who've learned from their mistakes, and uh, come out on the other side better for it. Uh, you could look at Churchill and just uh, the disasters of, of, of Churchill's career, many disasters of Churchill's career. And one of the great quotes uh, from a friend, when Winston is right, uh, he's right. But when he's wrong, my God, uh, with JFK, <laughs> your, bo your book, uh, your book does a great job, uh, not just painting a, a, a glorious picture of, of Camelot, but you talk about his mistakes. I mean, he had a, he had a disastrous uh, reaction to the Bay of Pigs invasion. He had a disastrous Vienna summit in 1961 with Khrushchev, just absolutely disastrous. He was ill-prepared. He left there, to, and he knew it, too. He just left there looking like a fool, being played by Khrushchev. And yet a year later, uh, he learned from his mistakes. He had an 85% approval rating, by the way, even at the low points of his presidency, as you point out. And he was prepared for the Cuban Missile Crisis because of those foibles. Explain. Well, you know, uh, when, when John F. Kennedy takes the presidency, he does so in uh, grand fashion with that wonderful uh, inaugural uh, oratory that we all now know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And even though, Joe, he had only won the presidency by two-tenths of a percentage point, Americans rally around their, their young president, were captivated by this young guy. But as you suggested, he has some early stumbles in his presidency, including the Bay of Pigs quagmire and then that disastrous summit with, with uh, Nikita Khrushchev shortly thereafter. But as he says, as he crawls back to the White House after his inauguration, uh, he sleeps in the, in the Lincoln bedroom and uh, uh, goes to sleep in the Lincoln bed. And a reporter asks him the next day what it was like to sleep in the Lincoln bed. And he said, I just jumped in and hung on. And that's essentially what John F. Kennedy did in his presidency. He jumped in and he hung on. He, he, he was not prepared for the presidency. No, no man really is prepared for the presidency. It's a daunting task. But he learned from his mistakes, to your point. One of the things he did uh, very astutely is keep his very jingle egoistic military at bay. They wanted to react. He, he, he wanted a, a cooler heads to prevail and desperately looked for peaceful resolutions whenever potential conflict arose. So, so Mark, to that point uh, that Joe just raised and you just addressed, uh, the Vienna summit in June of 1961 was literally six weeks after the Bay of Pigs disaster. So between June of 1961 and late September and October of 1962, when the missile crisis puts everyone in America and the world on edge, what did he learn about himself and the presidency, do you think, that enabled him to so artfully negotiate our way through the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, I think one of it is just that, that, that the military was very gung-ho uh, to to uh, uh, for the incursion of of Cuba in the the, the Bay of Pigs uh, fiasco, uh, and uh, Kennedy learns that you can't listen just to these guys, and so during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he 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 keeps his advisors extraordinarily close. He trusts them. He knows that they won't leak anything, and he looks for different ways out. One of the things that the military wants to do is strike the um, the, the, the missiles that are uh, actually have airstrikes. Uh, take take out the equipment that is already being shipped to Cuba, uh, and Kennedy doesn't want to do that. That's a provocative military action. He instead advocates a naval blockade, also provocative, but not as much so as an airstrike. And they they hold the Soviet ships at bay to prevent them from. Uh, carrying in additional troops and arms to Cuba and show the Soviet Union that we mean business. And during that time, as they're holding them at bay, 
uh, Kennedy is desperately talking to Khrushchev to find a peaceful way out of this deal. And ultimately, it comes through a quid pro quo. We take, uh, the Soviet Union takes missiles out of Cuba, and we take missiles out of Turkey. The world didn't know that until much uh, after the, the, the crisis. But that was the back channel negotiation that we had with Khrushchev, a quid pro quo. We take ours out, you take yours out. So the parallels between the Kennedy administration and the current day don't just end with tensions with Moscow, uh, he obviously he also confronted challenges to voting rights uh, and also inflation. Tell us what he did to combat those. You know, uh, with uh, civil rights, it's a complicated story, Jonathan. Uh, Kennedy knows he wants to be a great president, and he thinks he'll be a great president through foreign policy. This is at a time when the Cold War defines geopolitics. It's this, we are meshed in this struggle with the Soviet Union for hearts and minds about what the better system is. So in some ways, John F. Kennedy is trying to keep the civil rights movement at bay because we are vying for, uh, for moral superiority with the Soviet Union, showing that we are the better system. At the same time, the civil rights movement is exposing the world to the very worst of apartheid in this country, the, the divisions that, that uh, we create through this bigoted system, this prejudiced, segregationist system. So Kennedy doesn't want the world to see that. So he's trying to keep them at bay until he finally steps up to civil rights in 1963, so being pushed and pushed and pushed by the movement and tells Americans this is a moral issue. That changes the course of the civil rights movement. We're in a, 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 a time in history in this country where we're facing a lot of the similar challenges, plus the war in Ukraine. Are there any... Um, lessons for the current president out of uh, your work on this book? You know, one of the things, Mika, is that words matter. Words matter desperately. We're seeing uh, Vladimir Lezinsky, uh, Zelensky and, and, and how he uses words. His oratory is rallying the world. I think Joe Biden can, can learn that from Kennedy. Kennedy, uh, the, the, Clement Attlee, who was uh, the successor to Winston Churchill, uh, said of Churchill's gift for oratory during the Second World War, uh, words at great moments can be deeds. And Kennedy really shows us this. At crucial moments in his presidency, he tells us what things mean, not only to our nation, but to the world. Uh, he does it through his uh, Ich bin ein Berliner speech at the Berlin Wall. He says that all men uh, in this world who are, who are free are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, I say proudly, I am a Berliner. Ich bin ein Berliner. Mike Barnacle has the next question. Mike? So, so Mark, history obviously is looking at things through the rearview mirror, but history is a constant stenographer. It's recording daily and uh, moment by moment. Uh, the President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden, has taken a lot of flack for what is going on in Ukraine, unnecessarily so from the Republican side of the aisle. That would be my view. But what do you think history will say about the way that he pulled together an often separated unit called NATO, brought them together in strength, in unity, and consistently to this moment has done such? Yeah, I think he'll get due credit for that, Mike. That's, that's my view. I think uh, y you saw a very weakened NATO during the Trump administration resurge around this. And I think Biden did a very effective job of rallying NATO nations around the cause of Ukraine. Uh, we tend to scrutinize our, our presidents and get very myopic when it comes to their performance. History tends to sort these things out. And again, I think Joe Biden will get due credit for rallying nations around this so quickly and showing the world that this aggression by Russia should not and will not stand. Historian Mark Updegro, thank you so much. The new book is Incomparable Grace, JFK in the presidency. We appreciate your coming on this morning. It is